Hello and welcome to episode 202 of Dark and Stormy Book Club. Today we visit with the author, Colleen Cambridge. Enjoy! I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together we are It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club, a podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome! If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Before we start the interview, since we recorded this, Colleen has been nominated for an Agatha Award for the Best Historical Novel for this book. We congratulate her. We would like to welcome to the program Colleen Cambridge, who is the author of a new series The first book is called Murder at Malawin Hall. Welcome, Colleen. Thank you. Glad to be here. I like this book very much. Where did you get the idea of setting a book in Agatha Christie's home? Well, I have to confess, it was not my idea. It wasn't my brilliant idea at all. It was actually an idea from my editor. I had done the Lincoln White House Mystery Series with my editor at Kensington Books, and I think we've talked about them here on this podcast. They were not doing as well as we had hoped. Really? Yeah, it's kind of a little bit of a shame, but Kensington and my editor wanted to continue to work with me, and so they suggested this basic idea was Agatha Christie's housekeeper as an amateur detective. That was the idea, and they said, are you interested in trying this? And I was absolutely ecstatic because... I'm a huge Agatha Christie fan. There's a reason she's the best-selling author of all time, right? Definitely. That was the kernel of the idea. They suggested to me to write a proposal, and I did. They loved it. So here we are. I loved Phyllida. Thank you. I actually really like Phyllida, too. She's a piece of work, isn't she? She is. She's not going to take any guff from anybody. (laughs) No. I ended up writing a woman. We don't say in the book how old she is, but you can infer it because we know how old Agatha is at the time, roughly. And we know that they were friends because they were the same age. So you figure she's in probably her early 40s. I wanted to write a woman who was very confident in who she was and assertive and was comfortable with herself and knew her value and knew her worth and was doing something that she knew she was good at. I hope that that is how they came across because I think, you know, with women, we get to a certain age and things evolve when we hit our 40s and 50s. And I wanted a character who really exemplified that life's not over once you're done bearing children and raising them or whatever. And I'm not saying Phyllida has children, which she doesn't, at least as far as we know. (laughs) You never know. (laughs) Later on, there'll be somebody hiding in the bushes. (laughs) There's a whole bunch of questions around Phyllida, and that's purposeful. I like the idea of her bouncing clues off of Agatha. (laughs) I just thought that was such a clever idea. I put myself in Agatha's shoes, and I thought to myself, you know, as a murder mystery writer, oh, yes, I plot my mysteries. I follow clues along with the investigator. I find the killer. But my gosh, that's what I do on the page. I don't think I could do it in real life, and that's kind of where Agatha's at. She says, you know what, I'm just going to stick with my own writing because I can put the clues wherever I want. I can give everybody a motive. I can change the murderer if I want to change the murderer. But that's not how it happens in real life. So that's why she kind of steps back and Phyllida kind of takes charge. But it is fun for the two of them to talk about what's going on and to theorize who done it. Is Phyllida based on a real person or is she just completely made up? She's completely made up. Malowin Hall, which is where the book takes place, is completely fictional. The whole staff is fictional. 
The town of Listley nearby is fictional. I wanted to have a lot of freedom with what I was going to do with this series. And, you know, the bigger the house, the more places to hide dead bodies, right? <laughs> started out in the apple orchard. Lots of room to grow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I liked Bradford. Is there a little sexual tension going on between Phyllida and Bradford? I don't know. Did you sense some sexual tension? I certainly did. <laughs> not anything untoward. She's probably not going to push him into the myrtle bushes or the pond anytime in the near future. Mm -hmm. I don't think she'd have to do that with him. The funny thing about Bradford was I did not know he was going to show up. I didn't know that this character even existed until literally, and this is the truth, I was writing the scene. I don't know if you remember the scene where she sees him. She's climbing up the stairs in the house and she sees somebody. Right, she thinks working he's breaking garage. in. Yeah. As soon as I typed that, I knew it was the chauffeur and I was like, oh, this is going to be fun. I didn't know he was going to be there until he showed up. The whole thing was just so well written. It was just a delight from start to finish. I laughed out loud when Phyllida was snooping around the bedroom <laughs> and she jumped under the bed, but she was pointed in the wrong direction. <laughs> I mean, isn't that logical? I mean, seriously, oh, right? When you goodness. dive under the bed, that's what you're going to do, right? <laughs> and she couldn't turn over because she would make noise and they would know she was there. It was hysterical. Thank you. I'm glad that you enjoyed the book. It was, I can't tell you what a pleasure it was to write it. It really was fun to write. Now, do you have a plan for this series that there are going to be so many books or are you just going to see how it goes? Well, I figure I can write as many books as necessary. As long as they sell and the publisher wants more, I can always write more. Agatha Christie was a big traveler. She traveled before she met Max Mallow and her husband in this book. She traveled when she was young. She spent time in France which is why I think she probably created this character of Hercule Poirot, even though he's Belgian. She obviously knows French well enough to use phraseology. And then she traveled with her husband, Archie Christie, too, her first husband. I anticipate, as the series proceeds, there will continue to be some books that would be set at Mallowan Hall or in the nearby village of Listley or the area. But I also can see Agatha had a home in London. She and Max would go to the Middle East for archaeological digs. So there's a lot of opportunity. Maybe she's got to go to Paris for a book event. Trying to have a reason for the housekeeper to go with her is something that will have to be dealt with. But there are certain situations where it would make sense. I foresee the series being able to kind of develop and flourish as it goes along. I guess I feel like at some point, maybe if we get as far as eight or nine or 10 books into the series, the readers, if they're still with me at that point, will accept that Phyllida is just going to be there, whether or not it's 100% realistic that the housekeeper would pack up and go to somewhere like that. I anticipate the series being able to develop beyond just the area of Mallow and Hall, because we can only have so many murders. Well, I don't know. In Murder, She Wrote, how many murders were in that I, little... <laughs> In the town of Cabot Cove, you're either right. a victim or a murderer. So you exactly. Got, only two kinds of people live there. Exactly. Well, three, victim, murder, and suspect. There's probably a bunch of suspects, oh, too, but Yes, Midsummer Murders and Father Brown and all of those stories, they're all, it's the same idea. To answer your question, I'll develop a series and utilize the fact that Agatha traveled quite a bit, as makes sense with Phyllida. Have you written a second book in the series? Yes, I have. It's called A Trace of Poison, Ooh. and that will be coming out in October. I had just as much fun writing that book as I did the first book, so I hope the readers enjoy it as much as I do. <laughs> that one is set still in the area near Malaman Hall, but there's actually a murder fate, like a festival of mystery writers who come to town. Some of them are well-known, like Dorothy L. Sayers Ooh. and G.K. Chesterton. They come to town for a charitable event, and there's some, and all the writers are at a cocktail party, and of course, somebody ends up dead. Uh -huh. Now, isn't that a shocker? Of course. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun dealing with writers. Is one. that the beginnings of the detective club that they the detection had. club yes in fact that's exactly what it is as members of the detection club were there doing this charitable event yeah you know, when you the said the attendees are oh, mm -hmm. gotta be oh what a brilliant idea i had fun with it i mean you know you've got somebody who drops dead from poison at a cocktail party with a bunch of mystery writers and they're all arguing about what kind of poison it is because they've all done the research 
I thought it was cute. Well, we'll see what the readers think. You know, I don't know. You know, sometimes you write something and you think it's amusing and witty, and then you're like, well, is it going to go over or not? So we'll see what people think. Well, be sure and send us a copy of the book. Well, your friends at Kensington, they're yes, very they good will. About yeah, Larissa will sending do that. us books. We'd look forward to the next shipment from Kensington. <laughs> We enjoyed your historical series, the Lincoln White House. Thank you. And the was the murder at the Capitol, I believe. That was the third one, right? We yeah. did murder in the Lincoln White House, then murder in the Oval Library, and then murder. That's in the it, Capitol. the library. And I think that'll probably be the last one for a while because I'm doing the Philida books, and then I have another series on tap with Kensington that's more along the lines of the Philida books. So that will be under the Cambridge name. And so that's two series I'm doing with Kensington, and that will keep me pretty busy. What will that series be called? It's Tabitha Knight is the name of the main character, and she's a friend of a well-known female celebrity, semi-celebrity. But that's all I can really say at this point. The book will be out in May of 2023. Uh -huh. So we'll be talking about it before then, I'm sure. I really, really enjoyed this book very much. I'm a big sucker for more historical Historical mystery is my favorite genre to read and write. And yeah, this series, there's not a ton of the historical detail like there was in the Lincoln books and some of the other historical mystery series that are out there. I feel like it's more like an Agatha Christie-esque romp. But I'm not going to be dealing with coming to the Second World War. I'm not going to be dealing with politics. If I do, it'll be very, very light brush. It won't be that deep. As I was reading this, I wouldn't have been surprised if a Tommy and Tuppence character had shown up or even a Hercule Poirot had kind of wandered through the setting. Wouldn't that be fun? You know, maybe that might get incorporated in a future book. You never know. That is kind of a fun yeah. idea. Thank you for tossing that my way. I started reading them when I was 11 years old. I have read every one at least twice. Well, what are your favorites? Because I, I've been getting asked that a lot during these interviews for this book. And I'm a huge Christie fan, as I mentioned earlier. And I have my favorites. But what are some of your favorites? My favorite of all time has to be And Then There Were None. That, oh, it is I so mean, brilliant. That yes. is just brilliant. I would say Evil Under the Sun is way up there for a Hercule Poirot. The Mirror Cracked. With Miss Oh, Marple. for the Marple book. Mm -hmm. Yes. I would say those were my three favorites. I but... think I have to reread Evil Under the Sun. I don't think I've reread that one. I reread quite a few of them when I wrote this first book and second book. And then I read a bunch of ones that I hadn't read before, just that I hadn't gotten to, like The Man in the Brown Suit so... is a well-known, I guess. I think Death on the Nile is such oh, a brilliant that's... solution. What did you think of the movie? The one with Suchet? The new one. Oh, it's not out yet. Death on the Nile, the new movie. You're thinking uh, of um, Orient Express? Maybe I'm thinking of an older version, but it... David Suchet did a version of Death on the Nile, and Emily Blunt played the... What's her name? The woman oh, the oh, oh. There's a new version of Death on the Nile that is coming out in February in the theaters with Kevin Branagh as yes. Poirot, and Gal Gadot is in it, and so is Army Hammer and some other people. That'll be good to see. Although David Suchet to me, is the best Poirot ever, and Kevin Branagh just does not embody of course. Poirot. David Suchet becomes Poirot mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. he plays him. Kenneth Branagh, he is portraying Poirot. There's a big difference there. He's I agree 100%, and I love the way you describe that, because that's exactly it. And I don't know if you've ever read, and we're really digressing here, but that's okay. Have you ever read Suchet's little memoir about playing Poirot? Yes. Oh. You know, that just tells me so much about him. So, yes. I am a super fan of his. Here, I have watched all of those adaptations at least twice, each one of them at least twice, except I have not watched and I have not read Curtain, and I will not oh. until I'm dying. No. On my deathbed, I'll read Curtain. <laughs> I read the book when it first came out, and I was not very happy. No. Did you watch, here we go again, off the... <laughs> Pearl, did you watch the special David Suchet Rides the Orient Express? Not yet. It's in my queue, but oh, I totally want to watch it. He does such a wonderful job. He's a travelographer. It is just very well done. And I want to go on the Orient Express so bad. Oh, me too. <laughs> I know. I'm trying to figure out a way to write it off, you know? How can yep. you do that? 
<laughs> well, I was trying to get my husband to take me. Well, if he doesn't want to go, maybe you and I should go. I'm ready. I'll pack a bag. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate you letting me talk about my book because obviously the more people who know about it, the more interest there is. And I really appreciate you guys you know, having me on to spread the word. And I appreciate your enthusiasm.